properly. But um, we're going to be looking at heart diseases and their cure uh, by uh, a man that was a good friend of mine, actually, Wendell Winkler. He's passed on quite a few years ago now. And I had the opportunity to tell him one day in all the series of books, class books that he's written, that this particular one I thought was the best book on the market. And I'll explain to you that in just a, a moment. And of course, when we're talking about heart diseases, uh, we're not talking about a, a medical condition. <laughs> uh, we're not talking about that little pump that resides in the middle of our chest. Uh, we're talking about the very center of man. Uh, the Bible and even our own society refers to being our heart. Uh, and so you would have a young man who may be uh, courting a young woman uh, whom he wishes to make a lifetime commitment. And he tells her that he loves her with all of his heart. Uh, of course, he's trying to tell her that he loves her with all of his being, uh, who he is, his whole self, his uh, entire personality is being joined to her. Now, she may refuse him, and consequently, we would say she broke his heart. You know, we're, we're familiar with uh, phrases like this. In other words, her refusal has destroyed him from within. At least that's the way he feels. Um, so we freely talk about our heart. And yet we seem to be rather foggy when it comes to the concept of what it is and how important it is. Well, we're going to have some traditions we're going to introduce this morning uh, in our class. And the first of these is to always remember our key verse. And our key verse comes to us from Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, which reads, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So uh, uh, this is the most important thing that we have within us, uh, is the heart. And we are to keep it with all diligence. We are to be careful with it. We're going to be seeing in the study uh, what we want to include in our heart and what we want to keep out of our hearts, because uh, that is what really defines who we are and our personality and whether we are going to be pleasing to God. So let's um, let's keep that in, uh, in mind. I handed out some uh, uh scripture or, or memory verses. I want you to know that I'm not going to be requiring you to memorize each of these verses. But when I say something, I want you to be able to know where that's found in the Bible. So you'll have reference uh, to it. We'll say a little bit more about it uh, in just a moment. But first of all, let's get into our class with a prayer. Let's bow. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be able to be here this morning. We know that we're living during difficult times. And even as we sit in this auditorium, we realize that we have to keep a safe distance from one another because of the pandemic in our country and all through the world. But we pray, dear God, that we may cherish our time together that we will enjoy the fellowship that we have in sharing the very thoughts of our own hearts with one another and that we will still become closer joined together as a body of your people. We are so grateful that we have been honored to be called your children. We're so thankful for that birth that brings us into our new relationship with you. We're so thankful for those people in the past who have had such wonderful influence upon us to bring us to this present time. As many of them have passed from this life, but their influence carries on. 
and we are grateful for that. We are grateful for all the providential events that have taken place in our lives to bring us to this point now. And we pray, dear God, as we enter into the study, that we may each search our own hearts, that our hearts may be soft, may, may they be receptive to whatever you would have us to be. And please, dear Lord, may our hearts not be hard. We're so thankful for you, the heart, your heart, that you have exhibited to us that we can imitate, even to the sending of your son into this world to show us how to live, but also to die for our sins so that we can have that new life in him. And it's in his name that we offer up this prayer of petition and thanksgiving as we pray, amen. Okay, well, that's the first tradition we're going to establish. We're going to always begin uh, within the first few minutes, asking, what is our key verse for this uh, class? Our theme verse, and we've already seen it's Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Uh, I find it very interesting that the book of Proverbs is written for a father to his son and uh, preparing that boy for life. And uh, the father is saying, listen to the words of your father. And there are all kinds of uh, warnings found in Proverbs and also instruction as to what can be done and what cannot be done. But all this comes around to protecting the heart of his son, because if it's not protected, uh, his life will be in misery. And, and of course, in eternity, uh, he will never see his creator, at least he'll never live with him for eternity. So um, here's another tradition that we're going to have, and we're going to begin our class with a psalm. So, sort of like what we do every Sunday morning, uh, sort of a call to worship. We always have some sort of song and then we enter into our, our worship. I don't know if you know the song or not, but um, uh, this is all there is. There's now another screen. <laughs> but uh, notice the words, into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. So let's, um, we're going to always sing it twice. And that will introduce our study. When you hear that, you know we're going into our study uh, for that particular day. So let's sing it. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> now, as we are looking into our study, you may ask the question, why are we repeating this? Uh, and uh, the reason being is that even with our new shepherds, uh, I, I feel like that this is a study that uh, would try to encourage all new members to become associated with. Uh, you know, we have uh, experienced great harmony in this congregation. 
Uh, I've seen congregations even around us uh, who uh, divide. Uh, they have splits and so on. And you'll find that most of the time, the cause of those splits is not over doctrine. It's over personalities. And uh, people not being able to uh, get along uh, with one another, they say things that ought not to be said. And a lot of the things that are coming out are coming out from their hearts. And we're going to be looking at some passages here. And so that is one thing that we uh, want to do. In fact, I've noted in the previous times that I've taught the class, there have been drastic changes in some people's lives. And, and they have attributed to the class because you, you, get it, you get into wrong thought processes and uh, you, you start assuming things to be true that are not really true. And so you are the source of your own demise. And uh, that is, uh, that's a tragic uh, thing to see. Yes, Brother Bergstrom. You know, what I'm really hoping to find in this class as well, um, to help out the young ones as well as the new Christians, um, we have lost the ability to respect one another in spite of differences. Okay. It used to be very easy that, okay, you have a little bit of a different point of view, but I still respect you for it. Mm -hmm. But now it seems like if you don't have the exact same opinion as I do, then we can't be associated with one another. Brother Bergstrom, if you can't hear on Zoom, is talking about the, uh, the fact that uh, we've sort of lost respect for one another, one another as far as our association, even to the point that we become rather intolerant to people who may be different than we are or say things that are different uh, than what we think that, uh, they should be. And I'm, I'm afraid that a lot of that, Brother Bergstrom, is due to the social media. Uh, we are actually losing social skills. Uh, we don't even, uh, I see children sitting on the same couch t texting one another messages. And, and I have a bright, I have a brilliant idea. If, if you want to uh, say something to somebody who's sitting next to you, <laughs> but no, they're, they're doing this. And, and it's really hard to uh, pick up really how the person is feeling or, or thinking. Uh, unless, of course, they put all, all capital letters, then you know they're mad, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and so uh, it's isolating people. Even though we think the social media stuff is bringing people together, it's good to share information. But we're more than just information. So that's, uh, that's a good... Uh, uh, point to consider. Uh, the other reason why we want to repeat this, and this this is going to be going on hopefully uh, continually, even after we get through chapter 13. It gives our shepherds an opportunity to meet new people. So we're uh, not only are they in, in a class to learn heart diseases and their cure, but uh, they're learning uh, who these people are and hopefully be able for them to become part of the congregation. So that, that is a, a great advantage as well. Let's go back to our scripture reading. Uh, once again, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Uh, what is it that we are to keep all diligence? Our hearts. And whose heart? Our heart, my heart, right? I'm responsible for my heart. You are uh, responsible for you, yours. And so out of our hearts flow what? Yes, the issues of life. You say, well, what are the issues of life? Well, we could say, well, what's the issue, uh, issue of your body? It'd be your offspring, wouldn't it? it it's your children. What then are the issues of your life? It's really who you are. 
uh, the person who really resides inside of you. Uh, how do we know the kind of person that's within, within another individual? How do you know that? Yes, Don? Do you know it by the way they talk? That's the number, right? That the way they talk. The way they talk, the way they stand, the way they present themselves. Now you're into body language, aren't you? Well, uh, yes, very much so. Uh, the way they are. When you can tell somebody who looks like a Scam artist as opposed to somebody with integrity. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, for instance, how am I to know what you're thinking unless you do what? Oh. And, yeah, unless you tell me. Uh, that's, the, that's the value of words. And so, uh, Jesus, as we're going to say, is from out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Then, then we also have the word diligence. Uh, what does it mean to keep the, your heart with all diligence? Well, don't leave, uh, let your guard down. That's sort of negative. <laughs> What does it mean to be diligent? Yes. Okay. Scheduling. Yes, you're you're being very careful. You're you're protecting uh, your heart. Does the heart need protection? Yes, and that's probably where we fall down, first of all. Uh, protection from what? From the devil, from evil influences. Did you have something you want to add, Brad? Sure, even our, even our children are influenced by their peers. Aren't they? And so we have to talk to them about this as well. Uh, and so we are talking about the heart, which is the very center of your person. Uh, it could include a person's intellect. Uh, in uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 16, we read of the people's reaction uh, when John the Baptist, who we know is John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, was born. And uh, Zachariah, his father, indicates that the boy's name will be John. Now, uh, this is one of the first times in the New Testament that we have this. That's one reason why, we, why we're why we putting it up here. I uh, hope you can see this up on the screen. Uh, if you want to move over here, you can. You're okay there? Okay. This is a little bit smaller than most of the uh, slides. But it reads, so it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, uh, he shall be called John. But they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed. Remember, uh, he was dumb uh, because of uh, his reaction previously. And he spoke praising God. Then fear came on all those who dwelt around them. And all these things were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So when it talks about uh, uh, they kept them uh, the saying in their hearts, 
What's that intended to say to us? What's the significance of uh, that statement as recorded here? Yes. That's right. Do uh, you think they forgot about that? You know, uh, on Wednesday night, we've been studying from uh, the Gospel of John. And uh, Jesus comes across quite the controversy because people reject him because they think he's from Nazareth, right? And, uh, and so they think they know everything about him. But when Jesus was born, they didn't keep this in their hearts. They forgot that he was born in Bethlehem. But his mother did not. Let's look in the next chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. This has to do with the birth of Jesus. And it reads, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Jerusalem, uh, to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made, they made wide, uh, widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. Notice that? They let out this information. And all those who heard it marveled, just like you have with uh, John the Baptist concerning this child. Uh, uh, and heard that they marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So then the shepherds returned glory, glorifying and praising God for all the things that had, they had heard and seen. And it was told them. So what happens here is that the uh, the people there in Bethlehem don't remember, and uh, years later, people in Jerusalem don't know. But Mary will never forget that incident. So to set one's heart on is a literal view that means to give attention to something, actually to worry about it. Consider Samuel's words to Saul, who is about to become king over Israel. Um, Saul had issues on his heart, and the people had other issues on their heart. Not too long ago, we, we studied this in Brother Shresh's uh, class. Uh, really, the uh, uh, call of Samuel to become Israel's first king. And he had left uh, his home to search for the donkeys, weren't there, that had wandered off. And uh, that was his concern. But Samuel had another concern, and it was a concern that affected all the people. Let's look at 1 Samuel 9, 17. And it says, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me. What is the seer, or where is the seer's house? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer, go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow, and I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. 
Well, initially, what was all that was in his heart? Yeah, what became of my father's donkeys, right? Well, look at the next verse. But as for your donkeys, they were lost three days ago. Do not be anxious about them. That's, that's been his concern, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Well, it wasn't on the donkeys, was it? What was their desire? They wanted the king. And so uh, Samuel is making that known to uh, Saul. What questions or comments do we have thus far as we move through our study? We're going to be looking at now some of the uh, things that the Bible has to say about the heart. And then as we go through each of our uh, weeks, we're going to be looking at various issues of the heart. In fact, if you look at the uh, uh, memory verses, the sheet that was passed out to you, did everybody get one? Uh, you have basically an outline. I, I want to redo this, but this gives you an idea of what we're doing. Notice that every chapter has three verses or three passages that I want you to remember. If you came in late or you joined us late on the, on Zoom, uh, let me just say this. Uh, I'm not going to be testing you each week. You know, okay, I want you to quote to me from memory uh, these particular verses. But when, but when there, we go through the class and we're talking about various issues of the heart and I give to you certain words from a particular passage that pertains to that issue, I want you to tell me where it's found. Because uh, when these situations come up in life and you need help, you need to know where to go, first of all, in the word of God. So let's look at the, uh, look at the outline of our class. Uh, next time, in two weeks, we're going to be looking at overcoming unforgiveness. And there are three passages, Matthew 18, 21 and 22, Matthew 6, uh, I mean, Luke 6, verses 14 and 15, and Ephesians 4, 32. And then just follow each chapter, overcoming envy, overcoming ingratitude. We're going to be looking at how... Uh, uh, problems in these areas are really affect us. And one of the things that uh, they do is destroy our happiness, their sense of content. Uh, these are things that uh, keep us awake at night and alienate us from other people. Um, chapter five, overcoming discontent. And there, there are several passages there, particularly 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Okay, chapter 6, overcoming pride and arrogance. Uh, chapter 7, overcoming doubt, uh, disbelief, distrust. You go to the back side of your sheet and you have overcoming fear, chapter 8. Overcoming worry and pessimism, chapter 9. Chapter 10, overcoming hatred, chapter 11. Overcoming discouragement and frustration. Chapter 12, overcoming impatience, and chapter 13 overcoming prejudice. Now, to those who are at home, you will, you'll be able to secure a copy of the sheet. Um, I've already made it uh, available on what we share here, the OneDrive and uh, Brother Burke's room. Okay, he's gonna be sending it, sending it to your email by Flocknote. 
so that you will uh, have a copy of these and you'll know what to expect next week. Okay, let's uh, let's continue on. Yes, brother. Uh, yes, usually there it's King James, and that's a good question. And people say, "Well, why do they do that?" I mean, it's uh, the King James. You know, as years go by. Our language keeps changing and so on. Well, it has to do mainly with copyright. And most people, even when this was written uh, about 40 years ago, uh, the most popular translation was the King James. Um, and so uh, uh, we have the same uh, situation with uh, Brother Suresh's class on Sunday morning. You're looking for a word to put in the blank. and you may have the new King James, or you may have the new American Standard, and you say, well, it doesn't quite read that way. Well, Brother Baki, uh, this is about the best that we can do. And so uh, the King James Version, by the way, is absolutely free. There is no copyright. That's why, that's why they use it. Uh, it expired years ago. And uh, so you don't have to worry about copyright infringements when you use the King James. Okay. Uh, closely related to the mind are acts of the will, acts resulting from a conscious or even a deliberate decision. Um, this, is, this is something that we read about even in our giving. Uh, we're looking at now various aspects uh, of the heart. And uh, when we're thinking about giving, we naturally go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. By the way, do we have, well, uh, we need somebody to, to read. I don't need to be doing all the reading, but we need, they need to have a microphone. Is there anything we can do concerning that? That one worked. Who wants to read? Just for today. Uh, this isn't the life sentence. <laughs> for those on testing one, testing one. For those on Zoom, can you hear? Can you give me a thumbs up? Fantastic. Give me one second while I grab. Looks like Brother Baki will be our reader for today. And uh, each week, we'll give a different person the opportunity um, to do this. Okay, let's read 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay. Um, or you, you, your translation may say heart. What well, he's purposed. Uh, in his heart. And on the other hand, Ananias con uh, contrived his deed. Uh, remember Ananias and Sapphira? And uh, they lied to the Holy Spirit. And where did that come from? Well, we read about this in Acts 5 and verse 4. While it remains unsold, did, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay. So where did the lie come from? The lie came from the heart. Um, and so we're seeing there's something wrong in the heart of these two people. Ananias and Sapphira. Um, and that's, that's a tragic thing because now they are liars. Uh, and that has affected who they are, even with themselves, not to even mention uh, what God thinks about them. 
In Romans chapter 6, verses 16 uh, through 18, even when we became a Christian, there was something that happened in our heart. Let's look at that. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or, or of obedience, which leads you to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who, are once, you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So how did they react to the gospel? Yes. Right, because they had formerly been slaves of sin, haven't they? And uh, so Brother Miller says, now they have been, they are slaves uh, to righteousness. At least that's the way we ought to be uh, uh, saying this. Um, but they had become obedient from where? Yes, from the heart. Yes, Brother Bergstrom. Brother Bergstrom was saying that uh, for new Christians, this is a hard thing for them to realize that they really, they have been uh, slaves to sin. And primarily being slaves to sin, really being a slave to oneself. Uh, you know, when you, when you start getting to issues of the heart and considering thoughts like this, you begin to understand why Jesus said, we must die to self. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Remember that in Galatians 2.20? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So uh, uh, that is a very difficult thing to do. As one turns his heart over to God. What, at what stage uh, in our salvation do we do that, that we turn our hearts over to God? Yes. I think when uh, we become baptized, what we're learning is baptism. We turn ourselves over to Christ because every time we become baptized, we die with Christ. And then we Christ. Yeah, you become a new creature then. But there's something that happens before that that you you turn your heart over. Yes. Right. Repentance. What is repentance? Change of heart. It's a change of heart that brings about a change or reformation of life. And in this case, as Brother Miller is pointing out to us, that leads us to the waters of baptism, doesn't it? Uh, remember when we talked about Naaman on Sunday? You know, uh, he's complaining about the water. But really, what was the issue? It was his heart, wasn't it? He's arguing with God. Uh, he's stuck upon what he thinks ought to be done. Is that not true of most people? You know? And so that's why Paul writes what, what he says uh, or what he does. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves, enslaved to sin, basically, to oneself. But have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which you were committed. And when they did that, they became free from sin. How, when, did they, when did that happen? Go back to verse four. 
It's when they were baptized right here in, in Romans chapter six. So this is important for us to see. It's an easy thing relatively to tell people they need to be baptized. That's just a statement. The hard part is repentance. That's the hard part. Yes, Brother Miller? Well, it's part of the heart. Either there also with the heart, you have emotion, you have uh, volition. Um, think of it this way: uh, all Fords are automobiles, but not all automobiles are Fords. So when we're talking it, when we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the totality of the person. We're also talking about his intellect. Uh, and, and that includes his mind. Uh, in fact, that's what we're going to get into the, in their next verse. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, something happened to Gentiles prior to the um, gospel dispensation simply because God had revealed himself in nature and they refused that revelation. We call it natural revelation as opposed to special revelation, which would be scripture. And uh, because the Gentiles didn't have this, but they did have natural revelation, proof of God. Look at what we have in Romans 1, 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What, what do you see in this passage concerning the heart? What, what had these people failed to do concerning their hearts? They did not, that's right, Sister uh, Anderson. They did not protect their hearts. Remember our, our key passage? Keep your hearts with all diligence. They did not do that. And so they did not go, they did not truly consider God's revelation in nature, recognizing who God is, that he is all powerful, that he is all good, uh, he, uh, and, and righteous. See, certain things are innate within us that we, we have the capacity of understanding those things if we will reflect upon them. But these people didn't do so. Why? What were they drawn away with? With lust, right? With themselves, right? The, the lust uh, of their hearts to impurity. You see, how a person thinks in his heart, first of all, defines who he is, and secondly, determines what he does. And what did these people do? They turned to every vile thing, didn't they? Is, is, if you look in, in our society today, and it's becoming more and more violent, you see that that's exactly what's happening. And quite frankly, I fear for my grandchildren. I really do. What kind of uh, what kind of world are they going to inherit? You know, we're we're people become very concerned about our environment. What's more important? the moral quality within us. Um, 
That's scary. Okay, Genesis 6.13. Why don't we turn the, I'm, I'm going to do that because you don't have a microphone. Oh, because people at, at home uh, will not be able to uh, hear you. Uh, well, bless his heart, Brother Maki is turning to it. Maybe he'll read it for us. Yes. Why, why did the flood come upon the earth? And it's, it's amazing when you read this. Uh, Brother Bergstrom suggests we read verses 11 through 13. Okay. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had, had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Yes. Um, isn't that something? Go back and read verse five, if you would. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Where's the problem? And when the heart was wrong, what happened? The people became wicked. And what's the other word that came out in this reading? Violence. It will result in violence. This is not the only place concerning the a Genesis flood that we read about violence. Uh, I can't imagine living at that time. We um, we see we're beginning to see it now in our in our society. I don't know how people even survive this. God just God just uh, destroyed them. Uh, took them out. Well, not only is the heart associated with the activities of the mind and the will, as what we're talking about, the volition, but it is also closely connected to the feelings and the affections of a person. Uh, our, our emotions uh, as such, uh, such as joy, originate in the heart. Let's just look at Psalm 4 and verse 7. You have put gladness in my heart more than the season that their gain and wine increase. Yes, more than the season that their grain and wine increase. And we, we talk about prosperity. Um, we, we, we talk about uh, our standard of living, but what's above that? Your joy, the condition of our hearts. Um, and again, in Isaiah 65, and 15, Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. So all this is coming... We're talking about emotions. Why, uh, if you were in the uh, Fishers of Men class, uh, why do why do we have to address emotion with those that we teach? Do you remember, Sister Anderson? Remember when we took off the E? That's right. Emotion is what motivates. You have no motion without emotion. You know, uh, you, you'll find people, you know, you, you uh, give them all kinds of scripture, you give them the best arguments in the world, but, but unless they feel emotionally attached to that, they don't act on it. Even on the day of Pentecost, you know, Peter, Peter sort of laid it out. 
right? What had they done? You have crucified the Son of God. But what was what happened that caused them to cry out, to do something? When they heard this, they were what? They, they were pricked in the heart. Now they're now they can't stand there and just accept the fact they've got to do something. That they had to repent and be baptized, didn't they? Uh, to make things right. That's why we have to address the heart. What, why the heart is so important. Another emotion of the heart is fear. The description of the heart of wicked Nabal, when he learned that David's men were going to attack him, were, not, uh, were it not for the intervention of his righteous wife, whose name was Abigail. Remember that story in 1 Samuel chapter 25? David uh, is fleeing from King Saul and so on. He seeks some help and he helps the, uh, uh, the employees, shepherds or whatever, of a rich man by the name of Nabal. And he, he just wanted to, all he did was expect a little bit of kindness in return. And Nabal was a nasty man. He was nasty right from his heart. And so when we, when we read what happens to him, we would call it poetic justice, wouldn't it? Let's, let's read that portion, Brother uh, Eugene, uh, just verses 36 through 38 of that chapter. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there... He was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore, she told him nothing, little or much, until the till morning light. So he was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. Then it came about after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Well, he starts out very merry in heart, doesn't he? He's drunk, right? But when he receives word, what David is determined to do to him and his household because of his nastiness, what becomes of his heart? What cult? becomes cold and he becomes hard. I kind of wonder if he suffered a stroke or something. You know? We don't know. But whatever it was, it killed him. After, uh, after 10 days. Discouragement or despair is described by the phrase heaviness, heaviness in the heart of a man. Uh, it causes him actually to stoop. There's nothing wrong with him physically, but there's something going on in his heart that affects him, we might say, physically. For instance, look at uh, Psalm 12, 25. This is from the King James. Heaviness in the heart of man make it stoop, but a good word make it glad. What does that mean to you? Yes, uh, Brother Miller. Yeah, we're we're talking about how it affects us physically, right? I mean, you can you can see a person, you know, what's wrong with you? And it could be it could be just sorrow. Or it could be that person's not feeling good about himself and he needs to take care of it. And this thing just keeps going on and on and on. But it, it, it will eventually affect his health. Um, and so that's what we're reading here. But a good word makes it glad. You know, people need encouragement. But they don't, uh, they don't need encouragement 
that tells them don't make a change. You know, you got to deal with what the problem is. You have to have a change of heart. Yeah, or habit. Right. I mean, how, how can you, uh, why would you want to praise or encourage a person to be stooped? <laughs> you know, uh, you want to encourage him to take care of the issue so that uh, he experiences gladness uh, in heart. Uh, sorrow is yet another emotion associated with the heart. Uh, John chapter six, uh, let's, oh, here's the New King James. I forgot I had both of them. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. But a good word makes it glad. Now, John 16, six, Jesus meeting with his disciples, night of his betrayal, right? Uh, he's trying to impress upon them. I'm, I'm going to die. You know, and so what does verse six say? Uh, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. It's, it's what they had heard was really uh, uh, causing the sorrow. And he's there trying to encourage them. Not to deny what's going to happen, but this is the, but that this is God's plan, and they're having difficulty understanding that. Well, what about Proverbs twenty-five and verse twenty? Um, it describes sorrow as having a heavy or troubled heart, like one who takes away a garment in cold weather, and like vinegar on soda. It's one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Anybody? Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Yes, huh? You know, By yourself. Can, it, can anybody think of a New Testament passage that might uh, be associated with what is being said here? Okay, because he had great possessions. He's talking about the, the rich man um, of uh, Luke chapter 12. Uh, he wants to know what he can do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus tells him, so all that you have, because it was a condition of his heart, was it? But he was willing to do that. And so he left a sad man. The passage I was thinking about that I think goes along with this. Look at the last, look at the last phrase of Proverbs 25, 20. Is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. What is that compared to? One who takes away a garment in cold weather. That's not something that you want to do, right? Or like vinegar on soda? What kind of chemical reaction is that? <laughs> you know, that, that's not a good out outcome. No. Or one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Yes, it's not the appropriate time, especially if they're necessarily if they're happy songs because a person's dealing with what's in their heart. In James chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let them pray. If anyone cheerful, let them what? 
let him sing songs. We sing when we are happy usually, although I found singing helps me when I'm sad. It helps pull me out of it. You know, especially if you're, uh, you're you feel like you're stuck in some sort of depression. Uh, and the, I think the reason that that happens is that you're singing good thoughts, positive thoughts. Uh, so it helps me, I don't know about you, but it really, it, it does help me or it soothes, yeah, that's true. Um, but these are things that really do uh, help people. Um, the heart is also the seat of affection of love. And it's described as being the opposite of hate. Um, I think what we want to look at next is Leviticus, yes, Leviticus 19, 17. Note what we have here. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Ooh. Man, you could write a book on that one, couldn't you? See how that, see how that verse fits together? You shall not hate your brother where? In your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor if your neighbor's done wrong, if he's done you wrong. But, but do not bear sin because of him. What's the sin? Hate. Boy, I mean, we have a chapter on overcoming hatred in this book. And, you know, people, people's thinking gets really warped. I'm going to get even with him. I'm going to hate him. You know. And who do, who do you end up hurting? Yes. It, it sure does. It, it chews up your insides. Uh, in fact, you may even have trouble sleeping as you, as you think upon this. Uh, the old expression, uh, I, uh, I spited my face by cutting off my nose. You know, so how I, how did I get even with him? You didn't, you only hurt yourself. And our society doesn't see that. It, this passage is not saying you know, if there's a wrong, ignore it, and, and you, you'll be a, a loving individual. You know, he says, if it's wrong, rebuke him. But don't let hate reside in you that you sin. That, that's just, that's, that's, a, that's a book right there as far as I'm concerned. Brother Miller? Yes. If you're going to rebuke him, rebuke him lovingly. Uh, make a contribution. Don't be a detriment. Um, a similar attitude, which uh, James refers to as bitter jealousy, is described in James 3.14 as coming from the heart. Let's look at James 3, 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. That takes a little bit of thinking to digest that one, doesn't it? Because what happens if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts? It leads to boasting, doesn't it? And end up lying against the truth. Um, the believer is commanded to love God. How? 
Yes. We'll, we'll be coming back, body, soul, mind, so on. Um, we're going to be coming back to Mark 12, 30. Originally found in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Paul taught, taught that the purpose of God's command is love that comes from a pure heart. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Yes. You know, over the years I've thought about this, and I've, and I've thought about Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, the consequence of even people not following the law. In fact, the, the, the Jews felt like that they could, uh, they could uh, hate their enemy. Uh, and, but in Deuteronomy, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, we also find that under that system, their conscience was never clean, cleared. Um, it's a terrible thing to have to live with a bad conscience, isn't it? Um, Brother Bergstrom constantly reminds me of a sermon I preached, I guess almost a year ago. What was it? Sin leaves, yeah, sin leaves scars. And people say, well, I can go out here and uh, I can do this. I know it's wrong, um, but I'll confess my sin afterwards and, and God will forgive me. But what's the problem? Our conscience has been seared, has, it? has not really seared, it, it has been violated. When it's seared, it doesn't bother you anymore. That's hardness of heart. And, uh, you know, really, that's what the Apostle Paul experienced for the rest of his life. Did God forgive him for persecuting Christians? Yeah. Even... Uh, with consent to their to their death, as with Stephen, but it laid on his conscience, didn't he? He had trouble with that. He called himself what the chief of the chief of sinners. You know, when we're trying to uh, raise our children and trying to get them to. Uh, receive good practices. And we're hoping that they will not uh, do something so terrible that it will ruin the rest of their lives. We are speaking to them knowing uh, what the consequences of sin can be. And so we say to that, to them in love. And we say that to them in love because we love them. We, we do not want them to experience uh, the residuals of sin, even though we have been forgiven. Uh, we don't want them to experience that. And so what we're trying to do is direct them away from uh, activities that will cause them to say someday, oh, I wish I had not done that. Or I wish I listened to mom and dad. Because now I know what they're talking about. And this is going to be with me till I die. And we, we don't want that. for I don't want that for my children. I certainly don't want it for my grandchildren. And so we talk to them about things like this. Brother Miller? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, we can, as evangelists and as Christ and the Lord, we can give others. But at the same time, do we ever really forgive ourselves of the wrongdoing? And that's the part that God sees the most as if we forgive 
we've had we've had situations here in the congregation. People got caught up in immorality. Congregation welcomed them. They, they repented. We forgave them. But what was the problem? They could not forgive themselves. And so we don't see them anymore. No matter what we try to do. And uh, I remember talking uh, years ago when all this happened to one of the uh, elders at Creve Hall, uh, trying to get some advice, you know, how, how can we help these people? And he gave some suggestions and I'll never forget the last thing he said. He says, Glenn, I'm gonna have to tell you, uh, these things rarely have a happy outcome. Yeah, yes. Yes, and you're trying to forget the things before and, and go on. That, that's a hard thing to do. Paul has to say that. Uh, Philippians 3.13. Um, that would not be in our Bibles were it not because Paul knew that it was important because we'd have problems. Why don't we just turn to you? If your Bible turn to Philippians chapter three. Um, this is something that uh, Paul is having to deal with for the rest of his life. I'm going to begin with verse twelve in our reading. I mean, sometimes it's just really hard to move forward when you have this in your past. And that's why he writes this. Verse 12, Paul writes, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Notice he says, I'm pressing on. Um, I don't, when I read that, I see the struggle, don't you? He's struggling. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press. You know, he's not just saying, well, I'm walking. He said, I'm pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind that if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. I'm sure all of us have things in our past that uh, are, uh, are that affect us even today. And we know God has forgiven us. But we remember what we've done. And why is that, Brother Brad? Because sin leaves scars. Yes, Brother Eugene. We continually look back at what we did and it's it's the sins are always still in our minds it hurts and we even continually ask him forgiveness even though he has forgiven us we ask him again and again because it's part of us that and that's the great thing when we can continue on as christians and people feel that sin so big in them that he's still punishing them for that sin and yeah um they or you're asking church. yourself the question, why did I do that? Yeah, why did we do, do certain things? You start things? questioning yourself, don't you? Uh -huh. I think also, you know, as I know when I'm grateful, like, by looking backwards and seeing the mistakes and the things I've made, the reason to turn those around and use them to do good for others and ourselves, to me, that 
between their law, you know, maybe it's part of repentance and turning that around to use this for good. Yes. But that's that productive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because yeah, he's that good. You know, he was here for nothing to look at, trying to make sure we don't repeat the same mistake. Okay, that's that's good production. But the problem that's talking about here is that you're constantly beating yourself up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah God wanted that out of our record. So what is being said here is that uh, we, we, we do have these things in our past, but we look for a way that we can turn these, th these around and use them because they are learning experiences for good. Suppose if, if you did these things and you're experiencing the consequences, could you not... Uh, Help a, a, a person who is inexperienced, a young person, uh, so that they don't make the same mistake. You know, when you go back to Proverbs, I mean, it's as though the son that the father is talking to, I mean, it doesn't really come out, but uh, the boy's naive. Kind of stupid, <laughs> really. And he and and the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. He, he's trying to he's trying to share his wisdom with the son. I mean, go back, read the first three chapters, and, and you see it. You see it, and so uh, that's how we learn from the past. It may not be our past, but it may be somebody else's past, you know, that, you, uh, that you're able to, uh, to learn this. Uh, these, com uh, these discussions are very good, and I hope they are, they are helpful to all of us. Um, uh, any other, yes, uh, thoughts on the other hand? Yes, Brother Baki. The problem is, is uh, people feel God's still punishing them for the sin. It's not that he hasn't forgiven the sin. It's that he's still punishing for it, and they can't move forward in other things. And he punished me, and he won't give me this in my life, or you continue in your life. And you say, why is this not happening? I pray to God for this, and maybe because still of that past sin, and I'm still being punished for it. And then they, they lose they lose hope and just go on leaving the church. And uh, well, they it's, do. It's it's Satan working on us, saying you're not forgiven. He's going to punish you forever for that. Uh, <laughs> they look, is, look to the afterlife that maybe they have a chance with God, but they're gone already. Well, when we go back to the, uh, Philippians three that Brother Bergstrom brought up, when you when you read those words. Uh, you know, he, Paul could have said, well, forget the past and just go on. We read quite a few verses here, didn't we? Because Paul still struggles with that. And sometimes uh, things like this can destroy a person because they're not guarding their hearts with all diligence. And as they, even as they get older, the heart can become harder and harder, and these feelings even become worse. And um, it may even end up in suicide. That's, you know, why do people commit suicide? Depression? To get rid of the pain. The pain, they can't, why do people drink a lot, a lot of the time? Yeah. To forget, to forget, that's right. Uh, but if we if we are God's children, uh, we shouldn't have to do that. Yes. Uh, I was going to say, my first is my first wife passed away. And the grief that I went through was her death. I have learned that when there's somebody who loves, Because of 
Yes, we uh, several about two months ago we uh, tried to talk about empathy and and show the difference between empathy and sympathy. We can sympathize with somebody who's lost a loved one, but only we can only empathize when we have experienced the same type of loss. And uh, but we do the best that we can. Well, I, I intend for us to stop at 11.30 uh, this morning. Um, I want just one more point and then uh, we're gonna leave it for that. We, we have kept it open to 12 o'clock, but uh, we're gonna try to keep it to an hour and a half. Uh, if we go over, uh, nobody's gonna strike us dead. <laughs> but, uh, it's okay, but I want to let you know that uh, I, my commitment to you is to try to keep you no longer than 1130. Um, Paul taught that the purpose of God's command is a love, and that comes from a pure heart. Let's uh, notice that if we read uh, in 1 Timothy 1.5. Did you just read this? Yeah. Okay. Let's read it again, because we got so far away from this. I want to follow up with uh, some thoughts. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Okay. Uh, I want you to know that there have been those who have tried to sidestep God's commands by teaching that the only obligation that the Christian has is that of love. You know, what? Well, Bible says this, yeah, but God loves us, you know, trying to ex uh, excuse sin, um, loving God, loving his fellow man. What possible flaw do you see in this position? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, we see that God has made the help, and he did not make it, but God accepts it completely Yes. That's right. He does not accept us as sinners. Uh, and you always hear that. But he's not going to accept you in your sin. You got to get out of your sin. And he makes a provision for that. Then you become a child of God. Then you receive the blessings that come to children of God. But people say, well, God, God loves me. He loves me even in my sin. I will not repent. I don't have to repent. And it's not even important for my sins to be forgiven. Because God, because God loves me. Well, he does love you. But he does not accept you uh, in the state of sin. If he did, there was no need for him to send his son into the world. That's right. John 6, 3, 16 wouldn't be there. So loving God from a pure heart means that we will do all that he tells us to do. That's what Jesus said. He says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Okay. Uh, any, uh, did you see any response on Zoom? Yeah, just, just the mic that I'm Okay. Well, this is our introductory lesson. Uh, actually, I'm, I've got a second week on this um, because there's there's a lot more on the heart just for introducing this. But we will try to get into chapter one next time. But I will first uh, finish this material uh, so that uh, we have a, a better understanding of what we're talking about here. Anything else? Uh, we'll try, those who are at home, we'll try to get this material to you. Um, Brother Suresh, do you mind coming to the microphone here and leading us in prayer uh, as we close our class? Thank you. Good to see you all. Uh, Saturday morning.
Please bow with me. <clears throat> Our glorious Heavenly Father, God of all creation, almighty and powerful, yet so loving, forgiving, we bow down before you in reverence. We recognize, dear Lord, you are our creator and our master. For we understand from thy scriptures, for we have been wonderfully and fearfully made. We thank you for having dominion over us. Thank you, Lord, for guiding us. Thank you for giving us life and placing us in your beautiful creation. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for this morning, for this day. More importantly, Father, for this class that we've come together to mend our hearts, to submit our hearts, to know various diseases of our hearts. And more importantly, Father, to do those things that the diseases of our hearts be vanished. Father, your word is beautiful. Heavenly Father, the man with the wisdom wrote in the scriptures, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it comes all issues of life. Heavenly Father, May we keep our hearts with all diligence. And Lord, your word is guide for us to keep it with diligence. We're thankful to your Lord for those of us who are taking part in this class. And we thank you for your servant who has taken valuable time in putting this lesson together for our understanding Father, we continue to enrich ourselves. Lord, please be with us throughout the day. And as we go back into the world, into our lives, may we always reflect upon the word we receive and acknowledge our Savior, Jesus Christ. And with all diligence, Father, may we work towards keeping our hearts. Thankful to you, Lord, for this opportunity and various avenues you continue to provide. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes, they can unmute themselves if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it. Oh, we're gonna we'll we'll postpone the fall cleanup day uh, until spring cleanup maybe. <laughs> but, but, So, well, again, thank you all. Uh, have a good day on Zoom.